Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hi, listeners. Jen here with you again today, and I have a great topic and a great guest. I have Cell Gaston. He is from the Find Your Daily Calm podcast, and we are talking about mindfulness or going to get into specifics about challenges caregivers face and how mindfulness can help us with that. So thanks for joining me, Sal. I'm glad to be here, Jen. And I'm happy that I'm here having a conversation with you. I've been listening to your episodes and uh, there's a lot of learning there. And I like the way you pronounced my name, very French. <laughs> oh, <laughs> No, here in the Philippines, it's phonetically, it's just Gaston, it's, uh, but ah. I like you, the way you pronounce it. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, I did take French in high school because, you know, everybody was taking Spanish, which, you know, being in California was actually a smart choice. French was not su such a op good option since I have only met one person that was a native French speaker, and I met her so far away from high school that I forgot all the French, so... <laughs> <laughs> Not a good choice, but one of these days I will get to France and hopefully I will relearn some of my French before then. We. Oui. So, <laughs> we, oui, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, you not only have a podcast, but you also have a connection with dementia. So, why don't we, why don't you talk a little bit about your personal history and about yourself, and then we'll go into the topic. Fantastic. My relation with, uh, my connection with dementia is my mother. My mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and uh, I don't exactly know the technical term because the doctors were not very clear, but uh, as far as I know, she was diagnosed with dementia in 2017. It was five years ago. And it progressed quite faster during the pandemic. And... Yeah, my my father died uh, in 2005, so that was about uh, 15, 17 years earlier. I guess that exacerbated uh, what she already had uh, as Alzheimer's. And um, in 2019, we saw it really deteriorate such that she wasn't able to walk anymore. So she's she's in a wheelchair. And uh, the challenges of being a caregiver to a person like my mom, uh, I'm not really involved in that because it's my brother who, and his family who lives with her. And I really feel the compassion when I listen to my brother and sometimes when I observe how they take care of her. So that's my connection with dementia. Yeah. And how long have you been doing the Find Your Daily Calm podcast? Oh, the Find Your Daily Calm podcast. We'll, it's going to be one year, if, April 30. So I've been dabbling in podcasting. The, the Daily Calm podcast was motivated by the stress and the fatigue that most people experienced, including myself, when the pandemic really hit us where we don't know where to go, what to do, and how to do whatever we need to do. So that was my motivation. I, it wasn't a solution, but it was a way <laughs> to find a solution. Yeah, so it's it's almost a year now. So your one-year anniversary is like within 24 hours of my the start of my fifth season. I've been doing this for four years, which is kind of shocking. And... I never thought about where I would go after my mom was gone because I assumed she'd live for many more years than she did. So she passed away two years ago at the end of this month, March of, this is March, 2022, at the very start of the pandemic. And I wanted to ask you a quick question because I know what our lockdown quarantine was like in the United States, but I don't remember what the Philippines was doing. So was it more restrictive than here or less? I think it was more restrictive. I have relatives and friends in, in Southern California, as well as Northern California, tell, telling me that 
you guys are really strict there. And uh, in addition to the mask, we were required to wear a face shield. Mm -hmm. So it's as if we were in a in a hospital all the time, even if you went to the grocery. So it was stricter here. And the lockdowns were really, they call it granular lockdowns here. Because each part of town, like a, in the States, you call them counties. Here we call them barangays, where you cannot cross from one barangay or one county to another. Because there would be, what, uh, guards and security <laughs> people stopping you <laughs> from get, going to their area. So, crazy. Yep. That is definitely much more restrictive than we have had. I recall my husband and I basically being like, we cannot take looking at these walls anymore. We cannot take looking at these same <laughs> trees, and the same road. So we went on like a, a short road trip, but it was into another county. And there was a, a restaurant that was open when it wasn't supposed to be. We won't mention it. Um <laughs> Best tasting hamburger I have ever had in my life because I think because it was it was not here. It was just out outside of my house. Um, it was a little unnerving, though, because they didn't have space outside. So we actually were inside. And I was like, I don't know about this. This is not probably a great idea, but we never caught COVID. So I guess we were OK. <laughs> but that was in like, I think, May of 2020. It was it was about six or seven weeks after we'd been home for six or seven weeks, and it was like, mm, okay, we got to get out of here. Oh, wow. and then you know, and we pretty much stayed in the car. But I asked that because one of the biggest challenges for medical professionals and caregivers, both paid and family, during the pandemic was trying to protect our elders from COVID. Oh, yeah. And then kind of on the flip side of the coin, sort of killing them with kindness and isolation. And I'm not sure that we've figured out how to do that better because it's it's a lot of personal choices. Like I know I wouldn't have vaccinated my mom for her protection. I would have done it if needed for other people's protection because my goal was not to prolong her dying from Alzheimer's, but to provide her a quality of life. So lockdowns and isolation not good for quality of life i'm very glad i didn't have to make all those decisions <laughs> cuz it it was hard enough having to make decisions based on as my listeners know she fell and broke her leg and we you know i anesthesia is not really a good idea for people with advanced alzheimers and, but she needed to have the leg fixed, but I was thankfully smart enough to ask the surgeon, you know, how long did I have before we had to make the, like how many days before it was too late to decide and what would be the pros to do the surgery or not to do the surgery. And he said that she would need physical therapy with or without the surgery. So I had a traveling ph physical therapist come to see her. She completely refused to cooperate with him. And I'm like, well, that answers that question. <laughs> so, um, and it was, you know, like many people have heard, you know, somebody falls and breaks a hip and two weeks later they're gone. That was pretty much what happened with my mom. And on the, also I learned a mindfulness trick that I shared with you when we were having our get to know, our get to know each other chat. Not sure that's proper English, but whatever. <laughs> uh, it's close enough. At least it makes sense. Yeah. And um, I was, I had an afternoon where I was walking across the house and I was very stressed trying to make these, you know, what felt like life or death situation or decisions. Uh, most of, most of our decisions are not life or death. And I could literally feel the emotions just churning up and I knew they were about to explode and of course, this was in very, at the very beginning of the pandemic, and we were trapped in home with everybody or just, well, it was just my husband and I, but that was enough. And I knew I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to explode. I'm going to, we're going to have a fight. It's just going to be this horrible day. And I had thankfully learned a trick from another mindfulness coach that's, and I stopped and I said, hello, anger. Why are you here? And immediately I went from angry, about to explode, pick a fight with my husband, make the day horrible to 
going, oh, I feel this way because I just want the best for my mom. I'm trying to make a really tough decision because I, I love her and I care about her and I want to make the right decision. And immediately it was like somebody flipped a switch and I went from like being a very unpleasant negative person to being somebody that felt really good about themselves. And I was very grateful for learning that. So I was really excited that we connected so that we could further that learning for myself and our audiences, because this, uh, this podcast is going out on both streams. <sighs> Love that story, Jen, because it's really an exemplification of mindfulness. You mentioned how you were ballistic to mindful. Yeah. And that's, that's an achievement in itself. Most people are going on in stages and would probably have what psychologists call imp impotent anger, where they would throw stuff or kick stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't go through that too because that's that's also destructive behavior. But what you just mentioned is the perfect example of uh, the three brains that we have as as a mindfulness coach. This was something new to me and at at the beginning I have to admit it sounded very woo woo because <laughs> what we have we have three brains. I heard that statement because we were taught in school, the education system was telling us, you have one brain, it's in your head, it's inside your cranium, and that's what practically tells the other organs, this is how you perform, this is how you function. But neuroscientists discovered fairly recently, or relatively recently, that the neural networks in your brain are present somewhat, not the same, but similar, to those that are in your heart and in your gut. So, wow, that's mind-blowing. That's a mind-blowing statement when I heard that. The neural networks in the brain are, we know it's complicated, but in decision-making, the head and the heart and the gut should be aligned. And in your case, in your story, that's a fantastic way of explaining it. Because in your mind, you are getting all the facts. And science would say we have 11 million thoughts coming to our, <laughs> to our person per day and it's filtered to seven and then you would only, seven million or four million, and then you would only accommodate around seven <laughs> in, in a given time. So at that time you were overwhelmed and the brain was accepting it and receiving it and saying, what the heck is happening? And then, your heart would feel, uh, probably you were feeling self-pity or, or the feeling of, of anger for the situation we couldn't explain. And your gut is saying, let's go for it. Let's, let's swing it. Let's, let's go for that fight. <laughs> but once, once they aligned, I think it's your heart that said, when you acknowledge the anger coming in there and you said, why are you here? That's a very mindful question. <laughs> and your heart took its place and uh, took charge of the three, I call it the trinity, and then told everyone, wait, look, uh, this is my highest expression. It's compassion. That's the heart telling you, wait, guys, head brain, gut brain, listen to the compassion. So they all aligned and said, yeah, I'll, I'm overwhelmed, the head brain says. And then the gut brain says, ah, it's not worth it. I know you're courageous, but use that courage in taking care of the people that you care about. So head, heart, and gut aligned. Some people would think, really? Three brains? But <laughs> think about it. There are decisions that you would make that you would say that makes sense, but it doesn't feel right. I've, I've been there. Feels right. We've all been there. <laughs> it feels right. I feel happy about it, but it's not sensible. The common sense is saying that's a crazy idea. <laughs> and some people would say crazy ideas would be so crazy. It's crazy enough that it would probably work. So the alignment there is part of the mindfulness. That makes sense. I was recently on another podcast where we were discussing how to choose a care home. And when they asked mm -hmm. if I was, if I would 
they, it was kind of last minute and I, they asked, and I said, sure, but I will be your poster child for probably how not to do it because <laughs> I chose a place based on gut instinct. I did no research. I didn't look at Google. I didn't look at, um, you know, like state licensing board, th- whatever's I still, even after being on the podcast, not sure what I should have been looking at. I would back go, but I now know who to ask and, and where to go for that information and mom's care home was fantastic. But sometimes I sit back and think, man, there was like this wealth of information out there. And I just went with what felt good, which, you know, could have been really disastrous. <laughs> I think I think the key was they let her keep her dog. And that was a big deal because her dog was very spoiled. And my dogs, I have golden retrievers. They love everybody. They hated that dog. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my dog, my oldest one who's gone now, whenever my dad would bring over his dog, my dog would be like, he would look, take one look at her and be like, I'm out. And he would literally go sleep in the dog yard until my parents left. He hated oh. that dog. And I'm like, I, I can't, I can't have this dog in my house. Right. And my sister already had two dogs and she took mom's cat. So when they said they'd keep her dog or they would take her dog, I couldn't give them a deposit fast enough. But I think the alignment that happened to use your terminology is my brain understood that any for-profit care community that would keep this spoiled, overweight, pain in the rump dog would probably treat my mom well. I mean, they understood the importance of mom, mom continuing to have her dog. And when they renovated and redecorated the whole entire community 18 months after mom and Misty moved in, they didn't ask me to rehome her. They danced around the bush and, and hemmed and hawed and, and, and kind of hinted and suggested, but they never asked or even told me. And so I, you know, after hearing what you're talking about, aligning the three brains, obviously my gut was talking to me through the heart that these guys will probably do an okay job because they're going to willing, they're willing to put up with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of dog was it? She or was a, it, a, a, well, no, let me think. We were just talking earlier. I recorded and I was trying to figure out how old she was. And I had to remember how she was a year younger than the oldest one that passed away at the end of 2020. So she would be, um, hang on a second. She would have been, 12 then which makes her like 13 and a half so she may or may not be still alive she was a black miniature poodle and black oh. miniature poodles should weigh about 15 or 16 pounds and she weighed right. 28 she was yeah. beefy <laughs> and <laughs> and the residents where my mom lived in the community they loved this dog they fed this dog they were so ever like i don't understand what it is with alzheimer's and other forms of dementia you know they didn't pay attention to the dog. They Every time the dog looked at them, they're like, oh, the doggy needs food. No, the dog needs exercise. <laughs> the dog needs love. Please stop feeding the dog. It's not love anymore. <laughs> and ugh, it was just crazy. But it 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 worked out totally fine. And I'm just, I'm still amazed when I when people talk about, you know, they'll ask me, well, how do you know it's time to start looking around for a care home? And my blunt answer is, if you're asking, it's time, past time probably. And then they say, well, how do you go about doing that? I'm like, I don't know. This is how I did it. I'm not sure it's the way I would recommend, but <laughs> you know, it worked out for us. So obviously, like I said, the heart and the gut must have been aligned somehow that just made my brain say, give them money. And then when it's time, we'll move mom in, which is exactly what happened. And I think with the process you went through was first you told everyone, especially yourself, uh, the, the first instance, you would say, yes, it's time. That's part of the gut telling you, yes, take courage, do it now. And then the heart would say, yeah, that's a compassionate thing to do because she will be taken care of as much as you can, as, as best as they can. And then the head brain tells you, yeah, these are the options. These are the available details that you can study. And even the dog, uh, Misty, comes into the picture because caregivers, including yourself and those that you uh, talk to, 
see the dog as, as she said, hey, it's, she, she's cute. She, let's give her food. <laughs> because <laughs> she thinks that they think that uh, the dog always needs to eat. And, you know, if, as dog lovers, we know that dogs, especially adult dogs, only need to eat about once a day. But the compassion there is that she's so cute. I want to feed her. But probably they don't know about the details of uh, uh, how a dog should be taken care of. But in relation to how she interacts with your mom is, is there. Um, the head brain tells us that having a companion dog would make a person feel more, cal more calmer. And uh, that's the compassion portion where you will f feel much better. And the gut says, yeah. It's a dog, and uh, you know, <laughs> the gut can be so uh, so backward at times because it's really uh, out there to help us go for or put up a fight or protect ourselves. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> now, when with your family and your mom, have you ever experienced what we call sundowning, where it generally happens mm -hmm. towards the end of the day, and they get very confused, and sometimes they're combative? Has that been an experience oh, with you guys? I've, I ne I've never really seen that uh, the way my brother and his family, my sister-in-laws, see that all the time. Uh, years ago, maybe three years ago, she was much more uh, stronger and with verve, especially when she tries to pick a fight. But what frustrates her is that she couldn't stand so she would lash out and pick on people and probably even throw stuff. So, yes, that happened. Is that what you call it, sundowning? Yeah, it's generally the, the story that I could tell that I experienced sundowning with my mom mm -hmm. the most dramatically was we, let's see, my dad had been in the hospital for a month mm -hmm. and I was taking care of my mom and because he refused to let my sister and I help, it I wasn't really sure what her routines were, and his mind went from okay to totally forgetful very, very quickly. Hmm. And um, it was right before Christmas, and so I was going to go get her nails done. <laughs> and my husband goes, oh, make sure you get her a pedicure, too. Because apparently she hadn't had her toenails clipped in quite a while. And I've never been so embarrassed in my life when my nail gal took off her shoes and socks. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. So this was in December, you know, shortest days of the year. And we were driving back from where I live to her town, which was about 20 miles. And it was right at twilight. And, it, and we were on the back country roads that were sort of dark. And so we went from some daylight to dark yeah. and the conversation just kept getting weirder and weirder. She asked me if I liked my house and I said, well, yeah, I do. And she goes, well, you probably should pay my grandparents for it. And I thought, well, the bank's not going to like that idea because one, your <laughs> grandparents are dead and I owe the bank the money. So <laughs> that might be a little bit of, you know, I just remember thinking that was very strange. And the, the, the darker, like as it got, between twilight and dark and it was, you know, and we're looking at trees and shadows and, you know, I have weird vision. So it was very easy for me to kind of understand her visual processing or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And we were just, it was almost like alien territory, like alien terrain. You know, it didn't really look like trees and hills and it just looked flat and dark and bizarre. And, her you know the, all the conversations just kept coming out of left field like it was just very very weird and the the later it got in the day obviously she would get more tired and her you know your your brain all of us our brains get tired and if our right. brains are trying really hard to function and process as somebody like our moms would be doing you right. know you get tired and you're like Ugh, i don't even want to think anymore so that's kind of what sundowning is. Some people experience uh, their loved ones might accuse them of things. You don't love me. That's they right. might. Yeah, we, they we might want to. Yeah. Yes. So if somebody is caring for a parent or even a spouse, mm. and they 
you know, it's getting to be about the end of the day and it, it can happen in the afternoon. I always thought sundowning happened around sundown, but um, we just changed our clocks forward. So everybody's like, my clock is all screwed up. <laughs> you know, my body clock is going, hell time is it? Because we lost an hour and I stayed up late because I was working on a project and it was like, I'm so close to being done, but I'm so going to regret this tomorrow when <laughs> when I lose that, that hour for daylight savings time. And <laughs> even the dogs are all confused. It's like, I swear, <laughs> what, I love daylight savings time. I think they just proposed a law that says they're going to make it permanent. Now part of the other part of the government's got to yeah. got to sign on with that. And I don't know if that's going to happen. It's fine with me if they make it happen. But, you know, this spring forward stuff is insane. But <laughs> I, it doesn't always happen at sundown. It, it could be the end of the day. It, it doesn't really have anything to do with the daytime or the light changing. But yeah. if somebody... It's I've got a couple of experiences that I'm thinking of, but a very common one is they you might be caring for somebody in their home. Like I might have moved in with my mom, God forbid, which is common for a lot of younger caregivers. And all of a sudden now mom wants to go home. I need to go home. And it's like, you are home. No, this isn't my home. And I'm I don't know if you experienced that. You might yeah, have talked to we did, yeah. Yeah. And generally wow. What we're, what they're looking for is a sense of um, familiarity and comfort, not necessarily right. a physical dwelling. And so that help, knowing that helps, but do you have like any mindfulness trick for how we can deal with it when they're flipping out over, they want to go home even though they're home? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the, you mentioned that. This is fantastic for my brother to hear and my sister-in-law <laughs> because they saw the brunt of that and they experienced it. And thinking right now, it's learning from you that it's sundowning. It did happen uh, in, in those times of the day. But my mindfulness advice for those, that pe those caregivers that experience that is that they are aware of the facts, the symptoms, what go what's going on. And I... Of course, further study or at least knowledge of these symptoms will really help. But the heart would say, I've had enough. This is too much. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And the gut would say, yeah, if you want to give up, just up and leave. Or just yeah, stay with it. Stay with it because you're more courageous than you think. So since we really need to be there, the courage needs to kick in to understand what's happening first that's where the gut aligns with the brain and then the gut would say hey what's happening here are the facts the brain would say and then the heart would say okay here's where we try to understand where you and gut brain and head brain will cooperate because my expression is simple i love this person and i've had so many experiences fantastic ones with when we're talking about our mothers. And that says a lot. But when due to your exhaustion, due to your exasperation and frustration, you probably would just listen to the gut and say, I've had it. So I go back to your example where you acknowledge the feeling. First, identify the feeling because most people would say, I have to, uh, what do you call that? Uh, I have to uh, be stronger. I have to face the music. But it's also a way of denying what you are experiencing. Like you do not brush aside your anger or your sadness or your frustration, you recognize it and you say frustration or in your case, anger, why are you here? And the hack, if people would, especially caregivers would ask for that hack, would be to come back to the breath because that's the most available thing. Like when you inhale and exhale, you acknowledge that. You inhale the frustration or the anger and then you exhale it away from you but 
in the process, you acknowledge that it's there. And neuroscientists always describe it this way, that when you inhale, it's your sympathetic nervous system that's telling you, all right, when we inhale, it's the same as when you're preparing for a fight or uh, a game or uh, a, a competitive sport. Inhale. But when you exhale, you are telling your parasympathetic nervous system, that's your head brain, that tells the rest of your body to say, calm down, guys, relax. That's the trigger. So the hack would be to take inhales, say, for four seconds and take longer exhales if you could extend it to six or maybe even double or eight seconds for inhale for four exhale for six and do that for a minute and i assure you the emotion will not be as dramatic as you would hope it would be but it's slowly get it's going to slowly get you to a place where that alignment will happen I, I love your story because that's that should be something that caregivers would always need to remember. That if you, a lot of caregivers would probably be either very cerebral, especially the nurses or the professionals or the medical practitioners, they would say, yeah, she's experiencing this, this, and that. But, you know, the thing with doctors um, no offense to any of the doctors, they would say the symptoms and tell you what's going to happen next. And then they would, they won't be, ex they won't be uh, uh, expressing it that way, but they would say, okay, now you know, right, bye. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's it, bye. And then you pay them, you pay them. Well, that's the profession. That's, that's what they do best. But the caregivers... And, and not, this is not to trivialize the doctors because they're very important. But a caregiving doctor, let's use the doctor as an example. A caregiving doctor would go to these two levels to teach a caregiver, how do you feel? Be mindful of that. And what's your gut telling you? Is it telling you to just take a walk, uh, get some air, uh, inhale and exhale, just go to the porch or outside, take a stroll? And that could possibly uh, fix or remedy whatever you're feeling at that moment. I think with the heart brain, because I've learned from, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of Tipa Snow. She's a very uh, well-known dementia trainer. She's also a fantastic human and hysterical. And she's been on, she's been on TikTok for a while, but she's, she makes videos about all the different challenges, changing dirty clothes, wanting to leave, and, and she play acts them, and she's really, really good at it. Wow. And one of the things, I've watched the videos, and I struggled with, like, for example, now, my, I was lucky, my mom never wanted to, quote, go home, mm. but that is very common for most people with Alzheimer's or a form of a dementia, and you know, if you have to deal with that almost every day, you know, your gut's probably telling you, lap them out, I'm done. <laughs> but if you can listen to the heart, like my brain, my cerebral brain, the, the, the overthinking brain would be like, oh my gosh, here we go again. And I know I'm supposed to do this, 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 and this. Uh. But if you could tap into the heart brain and say, you know, she's confused and she doesn't understand what's going on. And, and then it makes it, I would think it would make it easier to, to get into their world. And what Tipa always suggests and others as well is that you, she's, she's very good at sort of the improv where it's like, oh, you need to go home. Okay. Well, what, what's it, what do you need that's there? Or you basically acknowledge all of their feelings. You're not, you're not play acting that you're going to like, take them home. Now, some people do put their loved one in the car, drive around the block a few times, and then they get out and ta-da, we're home. That yeah. works for some people. It doesn't necessarily work for everybody, but I would think it would help lessen the frustration. And like my biggest problem, as I mentioned with my mom was totally overthinking things. Like, why does it have to be like this? And why can't, why can't all the 
advice that I've read and listened to and and been told, why is it not working for my mom? And just like, ah, that's where my frustrations came was mm. was not was following the plans and they weren't successful. And I have learned and unfortunately I've learned since she passed away, a lot of what that was was I wasn't I wasn't in her reality or her world, which mm. was, it's still hard for me to think about because it's like, but I like this one. <laughs> I like this reality or this reality is, is the only one I've got. I can't do yours, but I've been learning a lot more about how to get into their reality. And I think that comes from listening to your heart. Yes, it's true. Uh, when we go step into the minds of those that have dementia, I, I realize that their head brains are already compromised. For obvious reasons, science tells us yes, the brain is in a in a state of degradation. So, the gut and the heart overcompensates. Like the the story that you said, she wants to go home. Our mom wanted to go home to the province where she was raised, and that's two hundred miles away <laughs> from where we are. And she we told her because we didn't know better, we didn't understand the symptoms. We told her that's far. You know, it takes, what, eight, ten hours to drive you there. And if you take the bus, it takes you probably longer because of the stops. No, she would insist. She would say, bring me to the bus station. <laughs> and she would hit us with the umbrella because she's ready. She's up and ready to leave. <laughs> so, yes, it, it, I think, come to think of it, it's quite hilarious because she's, she wants to go home where she would arrive there unannounced had she been able to ride the bus but yes now i'm thinking she wanted to be in familiar circumstances or situations where she's probably regressing in those memories where because she would always call the her mom her own mom my grandmother in in the in the filipino language it's nanay so they would say nai nai that's her she, her speech patterns are, she's not conversant anymore. She would say, nai, 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 nai. So she would call her mother and then, you know, you would just nod and smile. And sometimes they I, think that, yeah. you know, they don't recognize, like I knew my mom didn't recognize me as her oldest mm -hmm. daughter because I'd lost a tremendous amount of weight. And I had a hard time, like, I'd look at old pictures and go, yikes, I've changed a lot. So it was far less painful when I was, when I confirmed that she did not remember our relationship. But she always thought I was her best friend. And it was always funny when she'd tell people, I've known her forever. And I'd be like, you think? <laughs> 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 Maybe my whole life, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was... It was easier to to process that, but it was all. But it took me a while to figure out how. Like I, she would ask if her husband would knew where she was going when we'd leave the you know the care community, and I would answer yes, mom, dad knows where we're going, and mm. it took me too long to realize that that wasn't answering her question. So it's that's obviously the head thinking and not the heart or the gut. Right. Right. You know, and it's, it, <laughs> she must have asked me that like six or seven times from her room to the car. And by the time we got to the car, I was like, I'm either going to turn her around and go back inside with her because I can't deal with this anymore, or I'm going to stick her in the trunk. And then I touched the car door and it was like, poof, the light bulb went on. I'm like, oh my God, I am not answering her question. Duh. <laughs> so it's just really funny how we, we can, accept certain things but not be in their their realm in other ways it was just i just yeah. i look back and i think man i really wish i'd known all this stuff 10 years ago when she was really starting to get bad but that's why i still do this so that other people can learn from my bumbling yeah. around <laughs> figuring no, stuff out magnificent of you to to have this because people need to understand it in the perspective of a caregiver who was with the the person twenty four seven, and it's think think about it, Jen, when you said that she sees you as her best friend, 
And we just mentioned a while back that the head brain is already compromised. So the gut and the heart is kicking in. She sees you as her best friend. So emotionally, she loves you. Mm -hmm. But she couldn't have a, the best recollection of who you are. And then she tells everyone. She has the courage to tell everyone. I've known her for years. So that's uh, the, uh, the residual effect of, of that is, come to think of it, is really good for you because they, she saw you that way. Well, they always tell you that you could, you've probably seen these memes on social media where they may forget who you are, but they never forget yeah. how you make them feel, which, okay, that is true. Um, but let's go deeper on that one. Yeah. I always tried to give my mom pleasures and, and a quality of life, despite, you know, the deg degradation of the, easy for me to say, <laughs> of her brain and, and my, lack of knowledge on how to be a better caregiver for her. So we'd go watch children, which I always made jokes that we were like the stalker old ladies. And the one, there was one day, this is funny because um, when this episode comes out, I will finally have taken another airplane ride, but I have not been on an airplane since September 9th, 2019. And I remember that date cause that's my anniversary. We were flying home from Colorado I don't know if you've ever been in Colorado, but man, the Denver airport is always delayed. Like always. <laughs> like bring several packed meals unless you want to spend money in the airport. <laughs> it's just like I kept saying, I'm not going to fly through Denver anymore. So this time we were flying to Denver. So we were on our way home, plane delayed. And I knew I was tired. So I'm like, I'm not going to take mom out because... It takes all of my physical and mental energy to stay in a positive mind space. Yeah. And I'm not sure I have enough of those reserves. So I brought a chocolate spice bread and some iced tea mm. and my wedding album, photo album. And I got there and she goes, oh, hi, where are we going? And I was like, are you <laughs> kidding me? We've been doing this for like two years. And now you remember we go out the day that I'm not going to take you out. I was like. I, I almost decided we'd go do something just so that I could maintain that feeling for her. Right. But I was, I was really afraid. I'm like, I, I didn't know which way would be more negative. If we went out and it, I got stressed and frustrated and she and I got into, you know, snapping at each other, or if we just did something pleasant in the courtyard of the community she lived in. And so I, I aired on that, on that. And she, she had a good time and the caregivers were looking at the wedding album and laughing. Cause I got married in 1989. So we're talking poofy hair and poofy dress. And <laughs> they got to see my mom as a, let me think, I think she was 49. I'd have to do math and it's way too late in the afternoon for that for me. <laughs> I've already done enough math today while talking to people. And so it's, it kind of gave them some insight to her and to us. And it just, it really was a nice afternoon, but I was, I just remember being shocked. I'm like, you cannot remember who I am or, or that my, your husband died or anything else. But now you remember that we go out all the time. I was just blown away. <laughs> I wish I had a, a, a snapshot of my face when she said that, because it was probably pretty funny. I probably looked like a cartoon character. <laughs> But that just blew me away. And so it's like, it made me feel good. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm doing good because she remembers that we go and I'm the fun friend, apparently. Okay, I, I'll oh, take yeah. that. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, is there ways we can learn to listen to our heart a little more as caregivers or even parents or maybe just humans in general? Because I really think we really need to start taking better care of all of the people around us, not just loved ones that have That's dementia true. Last it's couple so of years have not been real pretty on humanity. We need to be better to each other. So is there a way to learn to tap into our, our heart brain? Well, great that you mentioned the word tap because that's what you could do uh, physically and you have to be somatic about it, meaning you really have to do that action. There's, uh, again, a hack and I use hack in a good way <laughs> where you really want your three brains to align when you're thinking of say planning a new idea or a, a venture or an activity and you want to think it through you can be mindful of it if you do meditation you can do it while you're meditating but if you're not into meditation that's fine too 
But being mindful of what you're thinking is already meditation. Some people would say, I need to sit down and recite mantras. That's really not necessary at all because understanding what's happening to you, being here and now, is already mindfulness. And mindfulness is already meditation. So going back to being somatic about it, when you're thinking things through, you can hold your head or parts of your head. Literally hold it gently and then feel the energy. Sometimes there's pulsation if, say, you're experiencing a headache, you know, just gently, and then be mindful of what you're thinking. If you're meditating, it's going to be double because the brain waves will go to alpha, alpha levels will kick in, and new learning or any experiences would be enhanced because of you tapping into that brain wave. Second, if you want to be more mindful of your heart, hold your heart when you're meditating. So it's actually reflex for humans when we're all scared or uh, uh, afraid of some experiences about impending things that are coming, we would normally do this. It's very primordial and primitive. So hold on to that heart, feel it, pulse, feel it, beat. And to align the gut also, just hold the gut physically. You can do it while you're walking. Now, there's such a thing as walking meditation where you really don't have to recite any mantras or be mindful of your breath and measure it. No, because the more you are conscious of these things, of measuring, of being factual about what the brain waves are kicking in, what whatever is happening, you're not being mindful. You're looking at a textbook or you're probably basing your actions on a textbook. You shouldn't be. You should be accepting things as they happen at that moment. So holding onto your head, holding it gently, even at the back of your head or even at the top, and then to your heart while you're meditating and doing your breathing or ex the extended exhale would do well paired with holding the head, heart, and the gut. So if you're experiencing any stresses, any anxieties, that's the go-to that I would suggest. I've seen people when they're frustrated, like, grab yeah, their head, like, like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> or or the more dramatic, they would pull in, pull their hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking of my husband, and he doesn't have any hair, so he can't do that. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's interesting. We do that. We don't even think about it. We're like, you know, put our hands mm -hmm. over our eyes and think, oh my God, why am I in this situation? <laughs> or why are these people so stupid? My husband's a real estate broker and he recently right. had an experience with somebody that just could not handle the online signing of documents. And it was like, mm -hmm. it's not hard. It's not, I mean, like once you've done it once, the computer pretty much does it for you. It's, it's a little, a little n nerve wracking because when we bought our, our house, we just moved three months ago today Right. And there was one day my husband was like, oh, you know, um, so-and-so sent us documents. So I just went on your computer and signed for you. And I was like, mm, probably not cool, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really that simple. You just click the mouse and, but they were having difficulties and they didn't have a printer. And I'm like, how does one oh. exist with no printer? Am I that old? that I, I have a fancy printer that does all kinds of stuff. And it's like. But yeah, he just he I, he just had his hands on his eyes and he was you know just shaking his head like I just I don't understand these people and I'm like I'm sorry mm, can't help you but it was just funny but you know maybe if I could have helped him tap into like his heart brain to understand what they were experiencing maybe he would have been less frustrated because it really got quite yeah. irritating. <laughs> That's, that's true. You mentioned holding on to the head or closing the eyes. There's even an emoticon for it, the face palm emoticon. Oh, yeah. You're frustrated. So, yeah, even social media sees it as a natural thing to do. And that's actually the go to. Yeah. Because that it's, makes... we're wired to do that, those actions. So, maybe in a moment of frustration, when for the 15th time in a week, mom's like, I got to go home and like starts packing and packing all kinds of strange things, which is not uncommon. And maybe if we just take a breath, long breath in, 
super long breath out and hold our heart, right. maybe we can just like tap into that heart brain yeah. and and take a minute and then think, okay, I need to go with this, even though I hate it. I'm gonna go with it because she can't help it. You know, because it, it's it's not so much that any of the techniques for coping with these, I hate to use the word behaviors, but that's what they are. You know, it's not that they're difficult. It's just sometimes you've done them so many times. Like, if I have to play act about going home one more time, ugh. <laughs> just going to throw her in the car and take her to the bus station and let her go to the province. That's the God speaking. When you yeah. when you feel the frustration and you, you verbalize it or you vocalize it, that's the God speaking. Is it helpful to verbalize it and then just realize that, okay, yeah, that's not really a solution and... Does, does that help you align the three brains? That's an acknowledgement also. Uh, if it's going to hurt other people, then you have to think about it. You're, you're probably trivializing your heart brain and saying, now get out of the way because I want to curse at her <laughs> or I want to throw out expletives to everybody. No. But you ha really have to align first before even saying anything. But... Saying that you're angry and asking why are you here, anger? That's an and acknowledgement. That, that acknowledgement works because that's the only story that I really have. But you can also do it with sadness or any emotion. Like, why am I feeling, you know, why am I feeling sad today? Oh, well, because it's raining. Although I don't feel that way today. And, you know, I don't know about the Philippines or California, man. We... <laughs> We're about to have to like take uh, showers every couple of days because we don't get enough water anymore. But, you know, I, and it's not raining anymore. So, but, you know, it's not unusual for people to feel sad when the light is dim and it's raining and it's quiet and it's like, yeah. you know, you just kind of get yeah. that blah feeling. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's okay to say, why am I feeling this way? And then, oh, well, because. My body clock is all off and it's raining and my husband's out of town. Okay, that makes sense. Let's fix those things. So it it really is a very helpful technique, but it's hard to remember when you're interacting with somebody, maybe in a negative way, to stop and say, why do I want to choke the crap out of this person right now? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not a smart idea to choke him, but I want to choke him. <laughs> You know, the gut can be so humorous in that sense. Could could have a dark sense of humor, like the visual of choking another person just to <laughs> shut them up. That's funny. And the gut is actually the first brain that would feel regret if you already did those stuff. Like you <laughs> physically hurt somebody, you curse out at somebody, you would say, ah, that didn't feel right. Uh, deep down in my gut, I, I feel terrible. And your heart would say, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfectly good sense. That's really interesting. This has been really fascinating. Do you have any questions since since this this episode's going out on both feeds for me? Well, not so much as a question, Jen, because I could always listen to your episodes <laughs> and I'm having fun and learning. I just want to say you're doing fantastic work. Oh, this thank you. I hope people are going to listen to you more, especially in the Philippines where care, professional care for our elders or those with dementia are, is very expensive. So we need to learn and be able to uh, function much better, especially with our loved ones when we're taking care of them. Thank you, Jen, for doing that. Well, thank you for saying that. And I think I actually do have a pretty big following in the Philippines. Maybe that's because of you. Because I was just looking at that the other day I think I have a big following someplace else that's not what you would consider intuitive, like the United Kingdom or Canada. Those are there, but it was like Israel or Saudi Arabia or someplace where, like, one, they don't speak English natively. Uh, so yes. it's like, okay, you guys can understand. I used to, and I should probably go back to learning to speak a little slower because I have a tendency to talk a little quickly, but one of my goals is to help non-caregivers understand what all of this is about because it's it's going to be a bigger problem and more of us are going to have a situation where we have to deal with, interact with 
somebody that has a cognitive impairment. Yeah. Prime example, my husband likes to go to the clubhouse in our new community for lunch. And there is a gentleman there who obviously has some cognitive impairment. My husband's had enough experience that he recognized it pretty quickly. Um, he obviously has another physical issue. He had some some medical emergency happen a couple weeks ago. Mm. And I forgot exactly. I guess he had a he had a card. And on the back of this card were all the phone numbers for his kids. And my husband took a picture of it. Mm. And he at and he and my husband asked, you know, um something like, you know, does Alzheimer's present with problems with numbers? And I'm like, thank you for the out of the left field question. And <laughs> huh? And I said, can you explain why you're asking me that? And basically this guy is at a point in his, you know, the, the disease that his, he's not really sure what time of day it is or what season it is, or, you know, it's just, it's, it's typical. One of the, pro, one of the 10 warning signs is, um, issues with time and place. And this guy has it. And I, so I explained that to my husband. He's like, yeah, this guy's got that. So now he's got more tools and he can help like the bartender at this restaurant, <laughs> you know, because when you don't know how to deal with somebody, it's, you know, I guess your gut kicks in and says, e gads, I wish this guy would go somewhere else. Right. Right. And if my husband can help them understand then maybe their heart and their, you know, my, their brain, brain, the cognitive brain can work together to help this man. Cause he really should not be living alone. Yeah. You know, it's all of those issues, but it's like, that's going to happen more and more. You know, our law enforcement's going to encounter, you know, maybe somebody with Alzheimer's who is lost and that's they, true. they're not compliant because they're confused. And now the right. law enforcement, if they're not familiar with somebody with a cognitive impairment, I mean, we've seen all kinds of not pleasant things that happen with law yeah. enforcement because they don't have the training and we're working on that here to help them get the training, but in yeah. any country, for that matter, Jen, that's important because law enforcers, since you're talking about them, they really need to understand that. Yeah, and that's it's true. hard. It's like, are you, I mean, like, closer to the end, my mom would look a little disheveled and she would look confused mm. and she wouldn't be compliant and she would say weird things. How would they know that she had Alzheimer's right. and not on drugs? Right. You know, I mean, right. you might be able to guess based on age, but maybe not. You know, I don't know. Yeah. I, don't, I don't do drugs, so I don't hang out with people who do drugs. So I don't know how many, you know, 70-something-year-olds are, are on drugs. But, yeah, it's just that's one of my goals is to help people understand so that we can all help take care of each other. You know, maybe, you know, I, I was a caregiver, but now I try to help other caregivers because it would have been easy to say, well, mom's gone, I'm out. But I needed something to do, so I just keep doing this. <laughs> We all have to have a purpose, and this is my purpose. That's true. That's true. And this is fantastic. Well, I appreciate this. Sal is in the Philippines, as he's mentioned. I'm in Northern California, so it's it's the next day for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you, you feel great. You should be comforted by the fact that tomorrow will happen because yeah, I'm here. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Russia is not going to blow up the world between no. now and then. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, uh, what's his name should understand that he should align with the head, heart, and gut. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other episode, analyzing oh, people boy. who... <laughs> <laughs> We've had a few too many of those crazies lately, haven't we? <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. Well, I appreciate this. I thank you for being on my feed, and I appreciate being on yours, and I'm Please. sure we could probably come back and do this again sometime. Would love to. I love that, Jen. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.